Let's have a look at this case. Now, there's a 48-year-old multi-parous woman who comes with the complaint of intermenstrual bleeding for about two months. Uh, she experiences painless episodes of bleeding anytime during her cycle, lasting for about two to four days. Uh, the bleeding is bright red in color, scanty, much lighter than her usual uh, normal periods. Now, as far as her menstrual cycle is concerned, her cycles are regular with cycle length of about 21 to 25 days, bleeding lasting for an average about three days and average flow. Now, this is a case of intermenstrual bleeding, where bleeding occurs between, you know, clearly defined cyclical and predictable menses. The episodes may be random or may occur in a predictable fashion at the same day in each cycle. Now, this 48-year-old woman with intermenstrual bleeding, otherwise normal cycles, her LMP was about five days ago. She's sexually active and has not noticed any vaginal dryness. Uh, there's no history of dysmenorrhea, pelvic pain, dyspareunia, postcoital bleeding or vaginal discharge. There's no history of hot flashes or night sweats. She has two children and uses condoms for contraception. Uh, she has a recent pap smear that was normal. There's no other relevant medical, surgical or drug history. On examination, she is obese. Her pulse rate is 80 per minute. Blood pressure is 130 by 80. Uh, the abdominal examination is absolutely unremarkable. On per speculum examination, there is um, slightly atrophic looking vagina, but uh, the cervix otherwise looks healthy. And um, there's no active bleeding as of now. On per vaginal examination, the uterus is normal size, antiverted, um, uh, mobile, non-tender, bilateral fornices are also free and there's no adnexal tenderness. So what is the differential diagnosis in this particular case? Now, whenever there is a reproductive age group woman who comes with any sort of or any pattern of abnormal uterine bleeding complaint, particularly when there is, you know, active vaginal bleeding, uh, one should always consider the possibility of pregnancy associated complications. However, the clinical profile of this patient is such and the fact that her LMP was just five days ago, uh, the possibility of pregnancy associated complications is less likely. They can be um, cervical cancer or they could be cervical erosion. Uh, they could be an endocervical polyp responsible. Uh, they could be fibroids, particularly submucous fibroids or fibroid polyps. Endometrial polyps is another possible differential diagnosis. And in this particular case, since she is, you know, 48 years old, perimenopausal, one should also keep into consideration the possibility of atrophic vaginitis. Uh, the, you know, the vagina was also slightly atrophic looking. However, uh, the fact that she is not experiencing, uh, experiencing any other estrogen deficiency symptoms, like for instance, hot flashes or night sweats or any vaginal dryness, uh, this may not be the sole explanation of her symptoms. Now, another possible differential one should consider is irregular bleeding that can happen with uh, contraceptive use, particularly progesterone-only contraceptives, be it PO pills or uh, maybe, you know, injectable or implants. In this particular case, the clinical examination findings, as we saw, were entirely normal and um, her hemoglobin is 12 gram per deciliter, a TLC of 4200 per millimeters cube, a platelet count of 2 lakh per mm cube. Uh, there's no relevant medical or surgical or uh, you know drug history anyways so we rely mainly on the transvaginal sonography report so on tvs what we see here is a hyper echoic uh, lesion uh, present inside the endometrial cavity it roughly measures about 1.25 centimeters in this particular situation and very peculiar we also notice this feeding vessel sign uh, of these uh, you know which are seen on the ultrasound doppler as we can see here so this is suggestive of endometrial polyp. Now endometrial polyp arises from areas of epithelial and stromal overgrowth. The incidence increases with age throughout the reproductive years. It may be asymptomatic in most women or it can present with abnormal uterine bleeding. Uh, you know, it can present with heavy menstrual bleeding also. Uh, it can also present with irregular pattern of bleeding and can also present with intermenstrual bleeding, very typical of endometrial polyp. It may cause dysmenorrhea in certain circumstances. It can be associated with infertility, can be associated with tamoxifen. And as we can see, ultrasound raises the possibility, raises the suspicion. The confirmation usually needs a hysteroscopy and a histopath, uh, which will be done after removal of the polyp. So final confirmation can be achieved in that manner. Now, the management in this case, what was done was a hysteroscopic resection of the polyp, hysteroscopic polypectomy. It achieved three purposes. First, 
it removed the cause of the bleeding, so symptomatic relief. Uh, secondly, a histopath analysis was possible, um, you know, confirmation was done that it is indeed an endometrial polyp and we were able to also you know, rule out malignancy. So the age of the woman uh, plus she has symptomatic polyp. Uh, in this situation, one would always prefer to go for, you know, removal, histopath confirmation and evaluation. And simultaneously, because we did a hysteroscopy, we were able to evaluate the rest of the endometrial cavity as well. Now, sometimes in situations where, you know, hysteroscopy may not be available. I mean, ideally, the standard of care is hysteroscopy. But if it is not available, one could possibly also go for a dilatation and curettage. One would go in blind in that situation. But again, one will have to take care that the entire endometrial cavity is curated out. Now, sometimes there can be an incidentally diagnosed polyp. Like, for instance, uh, the patient is entirely asymptomatic. Maybe a scan is done for some other reason and an endometrial polyp has been picked up. So, in younger women who have no other risk factors for any endometrial pathology, um, who are, um, you know, not having any high risk factors uh, predisposing to endometrial cancer, there is no unnecessary need to, uh, you know, surgically deal with a polyp or to do a polypectomy. However, yes, uh, sometimes there can be situations where um, the woman may be dealing with infertility and uh, an endometrial polyp is discovered then. Now, whether to remove or not, I mean, if, if, if she is symptomatic with it, one definitely prefers removal. But if it is asymptomatic and in the context of infertility, particularly if, let's say, you know, some assisted uh, fertility techniques are being attempted, like maybe an intrauterine insemination or IVF, then most of us prefer removing the polyp in this situation as well. So, with this, uh, you know, incidentally diagnosed, asymptomatic or maybe symptomatic and, you know, the clinical context will help us decide how the patient is managed.